Sebastian, could you mute yourself? I'll do, yeah. We are just waiting for one more minute until our attendees have been completed and then we start with a webinar in less than a minute. So while still some people will join a bit later, let me already welcome everyone for our today's webinar or online conference, where we would like to speak about the study, which we as Greens IFA have commissioned recently. Uh, we together, Mikolaj Pekser and myself, Viola van Kremen, welcome you on behalf of uh, the Greens group uh, in the European Parliament. We are both members here. And we are very happy that we are joined today by two excellent uh, guests and speakers. First, there is Gabriela Nedz uh, from Hungary. She works for um, Transparency International in Budapest. Very welcome. And our second guest and speaker today is uh, Professor Sebastian Lagner. He has now the Chair for Agriculture Economy uh, at the University of Rostock. Uh, they will jump in a little bit later. Let me quickly explain our technical details where most of you are already well familiar with. Um, uh, we have a Q&A section. And of course, we would like uh, to give you the chance and to be as interactive as we can. So please don't hesitate and put all your questions and all your comments, remarks and advices to this Q&A uh, section, uh, which we will pick up um, and read out loud or give immediately to our guest speaker. While on the other hand, and that's also important to know, many of our authors will be amongst the participants, amongst the attendees. So in case you have a certain question related to one of the chapters in the commission, uh, related to a special topic, uh, don't hesitate also to raise this question and we can give an active role uh, to that um, author and he can speak up uh, and explain in a more detail uh, some of the empirical data or some of the background. So for now, let me quickly explain why we think this is an important topic and why we as Greens have already followed for a long time uh, what actually happened to the European money and what happened to the money in the uh, common agriculture policy. Um, we know that right now the three log uh, negotiations are going on and uh, we as Greens sometimes have a hard time to, find for, uh, to fight for reform of uh, this common agriculture uh, politics come from different angles, but nevertheless, we think uh, that the target of the common agriculture policy, such as biodiversity, climate change, social inequalities, um, and many, many other issues are not really met by uh, this big funds, uh, which are dispersed in the member states. When we ask in the budget control committee about the money and how that is dispersed, we always get the same answer. This is under the shared management and we cannot really uh, have an influence on this. This is of course not very sufficient and that's why we thought we have to make cases also out of that and we need more empirical proof and show what really happened with this money and why it is not such unfair, but why it has really a harmful impact to societies, to rural areas, to communities 
in, in some of the member states. Of course, we randomly have picked five countries. We could have taken other countries. We have taken those where we knew that there are serious problems, either from our personal background or while we are in contact with uh, people from the small and farmer business uh, community or while we had um, other indications that it would be worth looking into it. So we have uh, picked the cases of Bulgaria, Romania, the Czech Republic, Hungary and Slovakia. But of course, uh, we could have uh, uh, gathered and, and uh, talked about even more. We think it is important to have a systematic approach uh, why we really uh, have uh, should take a different uh, stand on this fight against corruption and also scrutiny. Of course, this cases of the Czech Republic where we have a serious uh, uh, problem with conflict of interest, but this will be all covered then later on, especially by my colleague, uh, Mikulaj uh, Paxer, who is himself uh, from the Czech Republic and who is very well aware of the situation there. But nevertheless, um, we see that for the next negotiation in the common agriculture uh, policy, uh, the member states, the council is still completely ignoring um, our problems and also what has happened uh, in the past and why uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, this harmful impact. Uh, could have happened. So our task today would be to give um, our speakers um, um, a maximum of eight or maximum 10 minutes to go a little bit more into details. Uh, and then, of course, we would have a debate in the second half of this event to talk with you and uh, to speak a more in a more interactive mode um, how we can overcome this problem what is important from your side and what is also on what should be on the green agenda uh, for the next year in in the european parliament therefore mikolas i would like to hear from you and give you the floor first uh, while from your perspective as a pirate from the czech republic but also from the, let's say, particular course of, uh, let's say, your uh, prime minister, it is important to have a reform in the cap. Thank you very much, Viola, for, uh, for the word and for uh, or, uh, organizing the event. Uh, you probably said uh, most of the story. Uh, we are, from, uh, or I'm from the Pirate Party in the Czech Republic, and uh, from very beginning we started participating in the parliamentary politics. We have observed quite strange pattern. Uh, there is a, a prime minister, um, the name is Andrei Babish, who is same time owner of the biggest agricultural company in the country, the Agrofert. And uh, the, the situation is somehow uh, the situation is somehow strange because like uh, that means that basically the person who is the biggest beneficiary of uh, the uh, agricultural subsidies in within the country is same time uh, controlling or like uh, deciding uh, on the way how they will be used what will be the what will be the uh, conditions to pay them. Uh, at that point, like uh, we consider that to be to be quite a weird situation, and uh, started addressing that uh, immediately, uh, uh, struggling into let's say a political conflict, which is uh, I would say kind of like natural and uh, happens when you uh, start fighting uh, corruption and uh, support the transparency. Uh, what we have learned during this this fun fight was that it's actually not really like uh, or it was not really like easy to prove that uh, uh, Andrei Babish is really the final beneficiary uh, of the uh, of the uh, agricultural subsidies, because uh, the way how the uh, anti money laundering directive in Czechia was implemented was not really uh, serving for that purpose, and uh, he was very much able to uh let's say hide the, uh, the, the the fact itself i mean not really in the way that it would not be publicly known however uh, it was uh, and it is still very hard to uh, force the authorities to acknowledge this simple fact when uh, i came to the european parliament i started asking is if this is actually uh, just a very specific czech case or whether it is like broader picture that affects more countries 
And uh, the, the very much impression we got in the uh, budgetary control committee uh, together with Ziola and uh, other colleagues was that this is actually a, a type of problem that occurs uh, quite often in uh, especially the, the Eastern European countries because the uh, local, let's say, uh, structure of uh, agricultural companies is a bit different. Like there is this heritage of uh, communist pasts and uh, that, that kind of like uh, defined it, how it works, uh, how it works now. Uh, so we started uh, digging into, and this study was basically a way how to uh, kind of like prove our, uh, uh, our ex expectations, whether they are uh, truth or uh, not. Uh, what I have to admit is that this is really like uh, a repeating pattern uh, across the countries, like maybe the names are different, but uh, we see quite often that the, uh, the, uh, the, the land and the uh, ownership of the uh, of invest in the agriculture is concentrated in a few hands in within each of the countries. Uh, very much affecting the local uh, politics. I mean, like uh, we can name Andrei Babish in Czechia, we can name uh, Mr. Lorenz Mesaros, uh, who is a uh, childhood friend of uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban. However, the picture remains somehow similar. During the study, we have learned that actually the European Union is quite like vulnerable towards the uh, towards this this systemic risks because, uh, as I said previously in Czech case, it is not really easy to define who is the final beneficiary. I mean, like uh, the, the the in various countries, uh, there are uh, the, the authorities or uh, like let's let's say the respective persons use uh, various schemes to obf obfuscate uh, those facts. Uh, besides, like hiding the uh, hiding the uh, information within the uh, register of, of final beneficiaries, they quite often like uh, split the companies uh, into small parts in just to avoid capping and uh, not giving the impression that they are uh, they are so big. And as we have like uh, no really uh, good way uh, how to find where are the uh, money being paid to, uh, it is really uh, it is really hard to follow. I mean, like. When the commission, uh, when you ask the commission to provide you the information, they tell you who is the local paying agency, which is like you can Google that quite easily. But they don't tell you whom the local paying agency actually pays the money farther. That's the problem of the share management and the way how it's being implemented. And uh, I'm happy that we actually using this study uh, really uh, released really like a lot of concrete uh, demands that has to be fulfilled in order to uh, to uncover this structure to make it uh, make it transparent. I mean, like we need a few specific databases of, of of companies. However, we don't have them, and there is no like format defined uh, uh, by the commission to to create them. And there is uh, there is not really like uh, an obligation for the member states to to fill them with the information. I mean, this is this is sort of like a business intelligence issue, which is quite like common to be resolved in in, in the private sector. However, in the public sector, for some reason in the EU, we are we were so far not able to resolve it, and this is something we have to change. I mean, like so much from my pirate digital point of view. Maybe uh, our uh, guest speakers will probably have, uh, provide much more like expertise on that. Excellent. Thanks a lot. That was a very good intro. And also, I mean, we will definitely um, follow up on the opportunities of big data and how to disclose uh, this information, which is now so hard for us to receive. Uh, the other aspect of uh, this, let's call it misuse or mismatch of EU funds is we still have a relatively high direct payment on each hectare. And this is something maybe Sebastian could explain us in a bit more detail why uh, this is so hard uh, to reduce this and why this money is independently dispersed by the European Commission uh, to the final beneficiary, no matter what he does and no matter how much conflict of interest he or she has. And this what makes our life uh, currently uh, so difficult, for example, in the Budget Control Committee. And maybe also what could be, from your perspective, a good agenda for the Greens uh, to work on. So please, Sebastian, you have 
the floor as a next guest for today. You have to unmute yourself, we cannot hear you. Yes, I thought I unmuted myself. So thank you. Thank you, Viola, for this invitation here. Um, and thanks for launching this study, because I think this study is really something in the core of the interests. If we want to reform a common agricultural policy, it's a really good in-depth study with many documents, a tsunami of, of facts and documentation, in fact, um, of the use and the incentives um, um, which are coming from direct payments. And it is following up on um, the New York Times report on uh, networks um, in Eastern Europe. And I guess we need to have a debate whether we are really supporting the right thing and the right people in Europe. So the core or the main question is, are the direct payments really fulfilling their expectation or fit for purpose, as we say? And maybe I start with a, with a short introduction. What is, um, what is behind the direct payments? That they were basically introduced as a compensation for the uh, price reductions uh, starting in the 90s or throughout the 2000s. So useful to, let's say, um, help um, the liberalization steps. They were decoupled from production, which is on the first glance a good idea to decouple um, an income instrument from the core production process. So that still has helped a little bit, but the next step to link payments to, let's say, public goods where the environment profits or overall the society is profiting, this is still highly insufficient. So they are just weak links to this. Um, the direct payments are still the most important uh, income instrument. We pay this per hectare to farmers who are farming on the land, no matter what they do. And there are just very weak um, limits if, uh, with regards to large scale farms. This is the one thing to debate on. However, the answer is not very straightforward. And the second big question is, of course, um, if we pay 300 euros per hectare or 200 euros, depending in which country you are, it is of course the case that the landowner is trying to get this money via the rental contract. So we basically support landowners. And this is problematic because the, the people who are working on the land, they have to pro um, provide public goods. They have to make sure that environmental laws are uh, fulfilled. There is so far no consistent scientific justification on direct payments. Um, if you take the age structure in Germany, um, we had the first price uh, reductions in 92, almost 30 years ago. 13% Thir uh, of the recipients uh, were not yet farmers. So 13% of the recipients of direct payments were not in the business. So they get um, a refund for something they have not experienced, 4% weren't even born at that time. So that doesn't make any sense. Um, as, uh, direct payments have a lot of pressure on the land market. We were in 2018 in Bulgaria with a study for BirdLife. And um, I'm happy that Irina Mateva um, from BirdLife, um, the B Bulgarian Society of BirdLife Protection is among us today because she was there also with supporting our study. We did interviews with farmers and they reported that you see in practice, you see fraudulent behavior. You see big farms pressuring on small farms, trying to get their land, not keeping borders. So plowing in land which do not belong to them. And this is incentivized by direct payments. And that is highly problematic. The second problematic thing is that in theory, we say direct payments are decoupled. However, um, some of the details uh, foresee that you have to pull out uh, bushes uh, if you want to receive direct payments. So you have uh, e uh, harmful ecological side effects. This was partly corrected in Bulgaria. However, we have to make sure to have that in view. And if you look on the so-called coupled payments, still 15% of the EU budget, they have 
huge climate effect. So this is something we should immediately abolish with this reform. And the, let's say the disappointing thing is that especially the German presidency did nothing to reduce the couple payments which are which can be regarded as a harmful subsidies. Let us have a short look on um, distribution of direct payments. You see the coefficient for um, different member states. And I summarized the Northwest EU, the South EU, and the East EU. Gini coefficient means the lower, the more equity you find in the direct payments uh, or the more unequitable, the higher values you find. And what you see is here that you get a little bit more to an e more equal distribution of direct payments in Western Europe, in Southern Europe, starting from a higher level. However, in Eastern Europe, the unequity is rising and stabilizing on a high level. So just from a structural point of view, this is an unequal instrument trying to equalize an unequal income instrument, um, an unequal income distribution. So you try to adjust something that you have rich farmers and less rich farmers, and you try to compensate that with a highly unequal distribution of direct payments. That probably doesn't make any sense. And you see here 2015, where we start with some redistribution measures and you see there's largely no effect. You see there is, is no effect of this redistribution measures and we experience exactly the same story in the actual reform again. So that um, is not really something which we call, could call system change as the German presidency has announced. We have business as usual and we need to make sure that the direct payments address really public needs, public goods. If we take, let's say, the objective of income policy serious, we would need to have a thorough look on the situation of farm households. At the moment, the Commission is only focusing on uh, the farm businesses showing that, let's say, the profit of farm business in comparison, let's say, to industrial um, uh, enterprises, and then arguing, well, the farm businesses earn less money than other sectors in, the, in um, an economy. However, that is um, problematic, because if you want to pursue income um, objectives, you need to focus on, on the household situation. For instance, if you look on the next slide, you have a number of earnings from agriculture. And this is into the typical statistics of the EU Commission. But what is outside these statistics is other income sources, something from biogas, commercial animal production, employed work. So we need to also look, if we look on the household, what is the partner doing? What is also the property and household situation? Does it make sense to support a farmer if the partner of the farmer is making a lot of money in the agri-industry or being a lawyer in the city and having a solid income situation? So we need to have a good argument why we do this. And the commission and the member states have failed to provide statistical data proving that such an income policy is necessary. So um, let me finish. There are some um, general conclusions, and this is basically from our Bulgarian study. And you see, we should um, uh, basically phase out and reduce the um, payments which, are, which do not serve the society. We should have a strong law enforcement that is really a chance for Eastern Europe. We should strengthen the agri-environmental schemes. I didn't talk a lot about environment, but the most important environmental areas are in Eastern Europe, uh, aligned to Natura 2000 and so on. Let me just um, make two very general remarks. What is the role of the CAP in Eastern Europe? You have high expectations from society to the European Union, but if the main thing of the European Union is inside, inside incentivizing fraudulent behavior or misuse of public money, then this is uh, the EU is not fulfilling 
um, those expectations and that is uh, problematic and can at some point in the long run lead to um, a withdraw the cup, let's say automatically. So we need to make sure that the cup is serving the public interest. If you want to read, we published a number of study. I can also share the links with you. We also published a scientific study on the actual um, cup reform. Uh, thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion and your questions. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. That was extremely helpful. And also your recommendation on the last uh, slide. I think we can also share then in the end uh, your, your, your last and also the recommendations um, below our or under um, our recorded um, uh, webinar here now. Uh, that was very handy and also from your own experience, you could easily draw the main problems with the rule of law enforcement and uh, phasing out of this uh, of the system in a more general um, sense. So, Gabriela, now from the anti-corruption uh, angle, uh, explain a little bit more in detail. I mean, you know the situation, of course, in Hungary very well, but I think you have observed uh, some of your neighboring countries, uh, how they uh, not only behave, but how they sometimes circumvent, circumvent um, let's say, the provisions of financial regulations and how easy it can be, for example, for Mr. Orban uh, to serve his family and friends with um, access to land, to incorporate the paying agencies uh, agency into his prime minister's office as he did, and so really to make sure that close allies uh, uh, stay with a lot of fortune, while for normal and ordinary farmers, of course, there is like an official program, but there is no chance to become rich um, as his uh, his his loyal uh, people around him. So, Gabriela, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I deal with the public procurements and the use of EU funds within Transparency International Hungary, and I'm more familiar with the use and management of structural funds, but of course I have a general view on, uh, on, on agricultural funds as well. But uh, I thought that first I would, I would say a few words about more general how the European legal uh, framework is set up, because uh, my and our general view is that uh, the European legal framework regulating the use and the management of EU funds was not set up or was not created with the thought in mind that certain countries would abuse this system. So the general, uh, of course, it was set up a long time ago before uh, the Central and Eastern European countries uh, joined. But the idea behind uh, of uh, the management of EU funds, the so-called shared management, is that the beneficiaries, the countries, the member states that are benefiting from EU funds, it's their own interest uh, to, to use these funds in a sound uh, way, in a, in a proper way. And uh, this European legal framework, somehow my, my view is, at least this is my view, that the European legal framework is not able to handle those situations when, when a certain country or certain countries or certain administrations uh, build up a system in which they systematically abuse uh, uh, these, uh, these funds. Because the whole uh, idea behind the uh, shared management is that the first line of defense is the national authorities. So it would be up to the national authorities to control the use of EU funds. It's both with structural funds and with agricultural funds. But what we see, for example, in Hungary is that these, uh, these, these organizations, these institutions that are supposed to check, to control uh, not only EU funds, but in general, uh, the government, they, they should uh, you know, check the, the function of the government or in general, or also those uh, units that should, uh, that should control the use of EU funds, they cannot uh, perform their roles properly. So just, just, uh, just an example, uh, so the first uh, line in protecting the, the EU funds, the, the financial interests of the EU, would be uh, the managing authorities. But managing authorities 
uh, in 2011, they were in Hungary, they were integrated into the ministries. So in different ministries. So these managing authorities and before, before 2011, there was a separate agency for, ma for managing EU funds, but now they are integrated in, um, in, the, in the ministries and they work as a state secretariat as different departments of, of ministries. And those units that are supposed to control the use of EU funds, they work under the same political leadership, under the same minister or the same state secretary who, who decide on which projects are funded. So basically, if these units would carry on their job properly, they should kind of blame their neighboring units under the same uh, department. The, whether they whether these units that decided on on the on the projects that were later on uh, were got grants from EU funds, whether they carried out a, out a proper job and whether they decided on on merit, uh, so that that's the first line of defense. These units so they are integrated in in the ministries. There's the audit office set up in in the European legal framework. That are uh, that basically they they report directly to the European Commission. So they say that audit offices are uh, a branch of the European Commission uh, within the national administration. But in Hungary, this audit office is integrated in the Ministry of Finance. So in theory, uh, they have some kind of independence. But at the end of the day, the employee the employee of the head of the audit office. Is the minister so I don't see you know the the, the institutional independence of of these uh, of these uh, uh, units or these uh, uh, agencies, but if we regard a bit forward or if we go if we regard beyond the, the system of EU funds uh, in in a in a, in in any member state, it would be the prosecution the prosecution that uh, should uh, uh, you know guard the use of public funds. But, uh, but in Hungary, for example, which is in, in a state of, uh, as we say, a state capture, we are in a situation of state capture. The, the, the chief prosecutor is a longtime friend of our prime minister. And moreover, the chief prosecutor used to be a member, one of the founding member of the governing party. So we, we can see in Hungary that uh, that the prosecution does not prosecute any cases in which you know uh, people around the prime minister would be involved. Um, for for many years there were no cases at all, but um, in the past uh, two three years there were three cases in which some some lower party members were involved. But you know these are small cases, not not really uh, symbolic cases. So this is a situation in Hungary where you know rule of law and the system of checks and balances are, degra are degrading or deteriorating, and uh, you know this European legal framework regulating uh, the use and management of EU funds cannot really cannot really handle this situation because it is based on the idea that the national authorities would uh, would control the use of of uh, EU funds. Mm. And uh, and what that and and uh, and just to just to react uh, what Mr. Paxa uh, said that uh, transparency is necessary. Of course, transparency is necessary, but it, I, we have to stress that it's not enough because in Hungary it's quite transparent. We see how the system works, and and journalists are able to you know to shed lights on on many schemes. Not only journalists, but we also do that. Uh, also, for example, the the data the information on public procurement is is very public in Hungary. I think Hungary is one of the best country in this regard that all the documents are online and we can see that. But if there's no uh, if there's no uh, control if, or there's no prosecution afterward, nothing happens. There are no consequences. Then then transparency is not enough. And of course, uh, it's a, uh, I see that uh, I think I used all my time, but just one sentence that, of course, it's a very difficult situation because the European Commission or anyone in Brussels would not be able to check to control the use of all these funds. For example, in Hungary, uh, in, the, in the programming period of uh, 2007, 2013, so it was an old programming period, 
only in Hungary, there were more than 60,000 projects financed from the structural funds, so it's not even agricultural funds. So of course, there is no such institution that could uh, check, you know, all these projects. So I, I don't, I'm not saying that I know the solution for these uh, systemic problems, but what I wanted to stress that the system is such that corruption risk is integrated within the system. And, uh, and somehow the, the whole European legal framework should be, re should be rethought or should be reimagined uh, to, to allow some kind of, to, to somehow to, to solve these, these systemic problems. And of course, if there are, I didn't really talk about the Hungarian situation as such, but, and lands, but if there are specific questions on this, then I can, um, I can talk about the, those issues as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gabriela. Very well your points. And, and, and let me just uh, remind everyone, I mean, Gabriela was drawing the picture of the reality in, uh, in Hungary, while of course Hungary might be special, but nevertheless, uh, Mikolas has, has uh, uh, explained to us that's pretty similar to what he has observed and people know from, from the Czech Republic. And so we see that Actually, uh, there is no institutional independence, which would be required under the financial regulation. But nevertheless, the Commission has never enforced uh, this institutional uh, uh, independence. There were no prosecutions so far. I mean, the EPO will start, but they fight for the, let's say, appointments, uh, which is not really clear whether we will fulfill all the vacancies and whether there is enough money and so on and so forth. So let's say the rule of, enfor a rule of law enforcement from the European Union um, has to fight for the budget more than uh, everyone else. And on the other hand, and this is also coming back to Sebastian, we see that, uh, let's say, the uh, member states succeeded in asking uh, the Commission to have even more competence in the next period on the, on the GAP uh, reform. I, I don't want to call it reform, the, 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 the GAP term. So why we see that it hasn't worked in the past, it was misused, there is no institution, uh, um, institutional independence, there is no oversight, there's no scrutiny from the Commission, and they give even more competence and even more uh, um, capabilities uh, to the member states instead of taking it back, reducing it, having a more conditionality factor on this, and really uh, look very carefully how, for example, the paying agency is being uh, uh, controlled and, and so what kind of people are in place, nothing, it is the opposite. And that's so frustrating for me. And then we see the numbers and the figures in our study where we see that the final beneficiaries are always people very close linked to the ruling party or to the uh, people in power and this is so unfair and this is so obvious and you think the commission has to act and then maybe Mikulash can comment on this. We ask uh, Mr. Dehan or other commissioners in our committee and they say, well, we can't do anything. Yeah. So you see, there's not even a try and a political will for, for, for reacting. Um, Mikulas, maybe you can quickly comment on what we can do and I will read out the first uh, two questions afterwards. Well, absolutely. I would first uh, just, just shortly react on Gabriela. Of course, the situation of Czechia and Hungary is still different because besides the agriculture, uh, this whole problem of misusing subsidies, it spoils other sectors. <clears throat> I mean, what happens is that the money that are being earned by the local oligarchs through the agriculture are by, later on being used in order to control the politics, control the justice and so on. So, uh, and, and the media, of course, uh, media are quite important in the whole, uh, in the whole circle, in the whole, let's say, business plan or how to, how to call it. Uh, so far, Hungary is the far uh, most problematic case in within the EU. However, shouldn't we be able to really like reform this system? Uh, the, the, this disease will spread to the other countries. And 
they are definitely not immune. So we, we shall we shall definitely uh, definitely fight it. And I, I mean, like when it comes to the commission, I kind of like understand that the commission uh, somehow uh, relies on cooperation of the member states. So they are always a little bit a uh, little bit afraid of uh, really like taking a strong stance uh, against them. But what is really needed uh, is to fight the corruption in the, in the whole Europe, and that means really we don't need to uh, to punish uh, any particular person. I have like personally nothing against Andrei Babish or uh, Viktor Orban or any other of the of these guys. Uh, uh, what we need to we really need to change the system how it works. I mean, like uh, we really need. Uh, good implementation of anti-money laundering directive. We really need to see all the data regarding final beneficiaries, uh, regarding uh, the, the structure, regarding the subsidies paid, regarding the land ownership and stuff like that to be in machine readable format. I mean, like uh, it should be available on the internet to be, uh, to be just, just like uh, achievable uh, to, for, for anyone, any, every single journalist, uh, just by a by few clicks. But it's not only about like to see them on the web page, but they should be really like easily readable uh, by by um, machines. The idea is that each of the journalists shall be capable to write a simple like uh, piece of code to really mine the data from the respective databases in the public resources and evaluate on them and be capable to really like report on the, the corruption cases that uh, appear in the uh, in the uh, local uh, local conditions. I mean, like, of course, it, it probably does not help in the situation when the uh, when the police and uh, justice are being kind of like controlled by local political presentation and not independent. In that case, I admit that this is not sufficient. But for the other countries, it's still a way how to not follow this uh, not follow this example. Thank you, Mikolaj. I will read uh, out the first question. Elite capture is a great issue, for example, for Serbia, especially related to agriculture environmental measures, because corruption starts to be uh, a fabric of social life. From my point of view, the EU has to enforce control mechanisms, especially related to ongoing uh, EPA measures. I'm familiar with the uh, abuse of internal and external funds uh, in the area of environmental protection and reacted every time. As Gabriela said, there is also a project agreement in advance and of course prosecutors stay silent. Let me read uh, the next two questions and then I would give the floor to both of you, Gabriela and Sebastian. Hello, thank you for the interesting discussion. I would have uh, two questions. First question to all the panelists and current negotiations of the CAP, we see the problem of a sort of a renationalization of the CAP, meaning potentially more flexibility and also control competences could be in the end allocated to the member state level. How uh, would you or do you evaluate this development? And second question uh, goes to Gabriela, it seems there could be also a problem in Hungary concerning conflicts of interest in the implementation of EU funds. Is the Article 61 of the financial regulation also discussed in Hungary? Many things. So maybe, uh, Sebastian, uh, you could, you could uh, start and then Gabriela, and then I would add some more questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess the question regarding more flexibility within the cup is a very good and very challenging one. Because let's say from an economic perspective, it might make a lot of sense to, let's say, give more flexibility um, to the member states to address their specific problems in the sectors. But, and this is often also overlooked by many colleagues in science who are very enthusiastic about giving more flexibility. And we've written that in our science study in 2019. So we were aware of this. Um, if the commission does not give, let's say, very clear guidelines, what they expect, how money is dispersed in the member states, how transparent the process is, and how, let's say, the outcomes, the results of the CAP policies uh, is documented. If there is no clear guideline given, this flexibility is quite dangerous 
because we know all these, um, these problems which are reported in this study, which are reported by Gabriela, by Mikolas. So um, we need to make, uh, take this serious. And, and in that respect, I hope that still that the commission picks up that problem and formulates clear guidelines. What has to be in a strategic plan? What has to be in a rule development uh, program so that it can be regarded at good, as good governance practice? So transparent, good governance practice is a precondition to give more uh, flexibilities to the member states. And I guess um, this study is very helpful to make this clear. I would later ask you one more question for the land market. Gabriela, you were the next one, please. Yes, thank you. So I agree about uh, flexibility, that flexibility in general is good, but somehow, uh, First, it's a prerequisite or precondition, as uh, Sebastian said as well, that uh, an effective control mechanism should be in place. So the commission should uh, validate or should kind of uh, check or guarantee that the national controlling systems work. And, that the, and then the specific question that was addressed to me, uh, currently, the financial regulation or, or Article 61 is not uh, discussed, but when this whole system was set, uh, set in place, it was in uh, 2011, this whole institutional setup was created because before 2011, there was a, a national development agency and okay, it was under the supervision of the government, but still it had a separate uh, hierarchy, it had a president, so to say, so still it was a separate entity from the government, but now all these managing authorities, controlling audit, audits, uh, controlling uh, authorities are uh, integrated within the ministries, and when this happened in 2011, the commission had uh, serious concerns, and for one year, um, the, the reimbursement or the the, the, the reimbursement of, of any invoices, so the um, transferring any money from any funds uh, was suspended for one year in Hungary because of this institutional uh, setup. Uh, so the commission had concerns and I think they still see the problems, but uh, somehow our government always managed to, always manages to, to explain, to justify their, their decisions. And you know, they can always uh, uh, play with legalities that they change a minor issue so the commission has to say that, uh, okay, they fulfilled some kind of uh, uh, conditions. So somehow, uh, somehow at the end, uh, so, so the government uh, did some minor changes uh, on, on the original uh, institutional setup, and then the commission had to accept. So, so after one year, uh, the funds were flowing again. So now the institutional setup is not really discussed anymore, but the commission regularly checks um, institutional aspects of, of, of uh, the Hungarian EU management. So for example, um, one or two, two years ago, maybe they were checking uh, how the government was controlling uh, public procurements. And there, were, there, was, there was a serious issue on, on controlling uh, public procurements within uh, the prime minister's office. So now the government basically fired everyone and they hired, hundred, hundred, actually they hired 100 uh, civil servants for checking uh, public procurements uh, in Hungary. So I'm, I, that's why I'm saying that uh, the commission notices something, they express their concerns, the government does some, something seemingly, but it doesn't mean that it's an effective uh, control mechanism. So, so yes, it's, these institutional issues are currently on the table, but are always on the table, but I'm not saying that the commission found uh, a solution to this. I don't know wow. if, it, if it answers. No, that, 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 that <laughs> answers a lot. And I mean, this fooling around with the commission, I think it's not so uncommon. Uh, I guess, Mikolas, you would like to comment on this as well, but I think the Czech Republic plays a similar game sometimes, doesn't it? Well, very much. I mean, like there is an ongoing ping pong of this audit uh, reports uh, here and there, uh, replies to them. Then all the time it happens that the audit reports are not really like being published. I mean, like uh, the the the, uh, the interesting story is that actually 
uh, all this stuff that uh, is kind of uh, kind of like un uh, unveiling uh, for like last two years is mostly being leaked because of some governmental offices uh, leaks that but uh, normally it is not not being published in a normal and transparent way which I consider to be a really like weird situation uh, there is an uh, there are ongoing struggles regarding uh, what kind of uh, payments shall be stopped I mean like uh, most of the non-direct payments uh, to, to agrofair company were already uh, stopped still however there is an ongoing discussion about like uh, how to deal how to deal with the direct payments and uh, so on so yeah uh, we see these problems and uh, I expect that this is this is a really like broader issue I think we have not digged that much uh, deeply into the uh, into the question of what are the uh, let's say powers of the, the European Commission to actually enforce uh, decisions regarding uh, the, the common uh, agricultural politics However, uh, we should probably do so, or maybe the, the agri team should, shall do that, because uh, obviously there is a big uh, space for improvement uh, in this regard uh, towards m probably most of the uh, member states. Thanks a lot. Uh, there's a third question, which I think is mainly to Sebastian. Development of the Gini coefficients for direct payments in the EU depends on the amount of payments what do you think? Uh, but uh, not on geographical region. Uh, that's also interesting. Uh, and then maybe if you could say a word, uh, the access for land, as long as we have the direct payment, um, the access for land will be limited, especially in those countries where you have weak governance and weak checks and balances uh, system. So is there from the, let's say, research point of view, any kind of how to say that we that we uh, weaken the gate uh, keeper for access of land in Germany we have the I don't know how to translate it the Grundstückverkehrsausschuss so if there is a new um, uh, lease or sales uh, treaty or contract this needs to be verified by a particular committee in the region so something like this is probably not so common in all the countries, while even this kind of committees will be then difficult to um, composite uh, with, let's say, independent actors. But I mean, from the research point of view, I would be interested in how can we um, make more transparent who gets access to land for lease or ownership uh, and how can we put in more compliance uh, from the uh, also um, from the member states uh, state side but first maybe you can ask uh, you can answer the um, Gini coefficient yeah the, the the question on the geographical region um the first part of the question is right. I mean, if you start with a small payment per hectare and you have inequality, this inequality increases the more you increase the payment per hectare. So that is, that is logic and that is right. But the thing is, it, it depends from also from the geographic reason because of agricultural structures. And this is, this is the point here. And this is why I also separated into those three uh, geographical reasons and what you can, could also see, I mean, we will publish the slides later on. So you see every country every year is one dot. So one observation, one Gini coefficient per year. And so you see that deviates quite a lot. However, what you have in Eastern Europe is this division in two parts. In Romania, for instance, you have 3.7 agricultural farms and 2.7 of those agricultural, 2.7 million uh, farms are below two hectares. 3.7 overall and 2.7 below two hectares. So indeed we have a huge challenge because those sectors are divided with very few, very large farms. And if I say large farms, it's 20,000, 30,000 hectares. And 
<laughs> it is pretty natural that you end up with much more inequality than if you have the largest farm in Germany, which is for instance 10,000 hectares or something. So it has to do with structures, not so much with a geographical region that doesn't really matter. It matters the agricultural structure is what matters. Landowner, gatekeeper. Um, there is the idea of controlling um, foreign land investment. So some of the Eastern European countries, and I'm not aware, I'm not a land market expert, but as far as I know, in some of the Eastern European member states, you are not allowed to uh, um, buy land in a country and you have those gatekeepers. However, what is happening is, first of all, it's um, you basically favor the big um, um, uh, agri enterprises in the country, which are already big. So they have an easy life if you keep every, everyone else out. That is the first thing. And the second thing is, of course, there's a way around it. Because as an investor, you can simply take one of the agri farms and buy shares of this big agri farm, let's say a, a farm of 30,000 hectares, and you simply buy shares and <laughs> profit from, from their good situation in the country, then you keep everyone else out by, by a gatekeeper and uh, through this fresh money, you can buy even more land. So we need to have transparency. You, we need to have land parcel identification to know who, which specific land parcel is, own, uh, is owned by which person who is farming on that land. And we need to have a certain a good strategy is, of course, trying to get reports from the government, trying to have as much transparency on that as possible, I guess. It's my turn on it. But yeah, <laughs> Gabriela might also add to this or Mikolas. There is one more question where I am afraid uh, it would be difficult for, uh, for us to answer. What scrutiny powers does the European Parliament have in the approval of national cap plans? Um, so this national strategy plans and in the implementation. Um, to be honest, since I'm not a member of the Agriculture Committee, I don't know whether Mikolas is aware of this, but uh, uh, I'm not so sure whether we have any saying on this, or oh, this is mainly in the hand of the Commission to um, approve this. Uh, I don't think that we, as the CON committee, for example, would have any insights. But of course, I will ask the Commission, and I have already asked the Commission. Uh, so far, it is still negotiated between the member states or in the member states, and then it would be sent to uh, Brussels for uh, approval. But um, I'm not so sure whether we have any control or scrutiny in this at all, but maybe to other points, my colleagues would like to comment. Mikolas, please. If I may, uh, I would almost 99% uh, exclude it that there is a direct, uh, direct, direct way for the European Parliament to approve that. I think the process works that way that they simply uh, bring the proposal from the member state to the European Commission and the European Commission approves that or can theoretically refuse it if I understand correctly. But uh, so far, uh, my experience was from observing of the, let's say, national level of the agricultural politics. Uh, the European Commission was not really like too strict and allowed quite like problematic uh, problematic schemes to, to support uh, uh, support agriculture. In, in, in fact, it was very much like uh, uh, discriminative discriminatory against the against the small farmers and there was no objection from the commission so parliament has no direct uh, direct way how to do that however what happens every single year is that the, the european parliament uh, issues so called discharges for each of uh, the institutions uh, in within the eu which is basically a report uh, providing the information uh, that uh, the respective institution either did or did not perform well when uh, like uh, per per uh, fulfilling its duties. Uh, the European Commission is not an exception, like we, we, are, we are doing that. And uh, basically the process is that for first it is being discussed by the Committee for Budgetary Control and subsequently uh, for the, uh, by, the, by the whole plenary. And of course, if the discharge is not being granted, it is quite serious, uh, serious issue for uh, for an institution. I mean, like 
we have seen a uh, uh, one of the commissions uh, like fall uh, fallen because of the because of not being granted discharge. So uh, this could this could theoretically happen. And when it comes to the discussion about the discharges, I believe uh, this is probably the the most important tool for the European Parliament to really raise this concern and uh, discuss it because the Commission shall definitely be much more stricter and much more uh, resilient towards the lobby pressures from the member states. I was almost there. Concluding remarks, thank you very much, uh, Mikulaj. Maybe Gabriela, you would like to add something or Sebastian, a final word, and then I would um, slowly come to an end of this session. Yes, thank you. No, just maybe just a thought that uh, in Hungary, uh, lands above a certain uh, threshold, and you are not able to buy or own the land, but it's a lease, it's a long term lease uh, from, from the state. And uh, with this, in a certain sense, it made the government easier, you know, to re re redistribute, you know, these leases, because if, if it were ownership, it's still still in Hungary, it would be more difficult to, to, to take it away and then redistribute it. But since these uh, big lands are basically leases, uh, it was also one area in Hungary, but, but it happened in many areas, not only in the, in the land sector or, or regarding the lands, but it also happened in, uh, uh, under this government that they simply redistributed the leases and there were some very questionable um, cases in which uh, the biggest oligarchs close uh, close to close to the prime minister got a huge amount of land and it's very interesting because if we regard the biggest landowners are exactly the same persons that are the biggest winners of, of public procurements in, in other sectors, in constructions and so on. So basically the same, exactly the same players are in the land sector or in agriculture as well as in other areas in, in the economy. But just, just it was just a thought that uh, after I heard what uh, Sebastian was saying. And thank you so much for organizing this event. No, thanks. That's a very good indicator. That's also something which we could cross uh, sector also uh, um, investigate. Very good hint. Thanks a lot, Gabriela. Sebastian, yeah. a final sentence from your side for today's um, topic. Yeah, thank you. That Those are very helpful remarks from Eastern Europe, I guess. Um, and I guess um, the question from Harriet Bradley, Harriet, hello, um, I mean, it's a good one. Uh, who is deciding on the national cap plans and are le law enforcement and transparency criteria mentioned in those cap strategic plans? So maybe this is even a good idea to think about what could be the role of the EU parliament. I don't know whether there is scope for negotiations, but I guess the cap plans Controlling the cap plans, having proper cap plans could help to improve this. So good idea. Thank you. Thank you for this event. Yes, thanks a lot for participating, for preparing us uh, in an even broader way while we have, uh, I mean, already in the study, thanks to our authors, a lot of homework to do. And I see the same problem as, as Gabriela and Sebastian Mikolas have said before this um, and national strategy plans, they will be crucial and it will be important for us to have an insight, to have uh, to have a scrutiny. But nevertheless, also what uh, Gabriela has said before, we should ask for more institutional independence. We should really try to get this law enforcement agencies uh, in a, I mean, completely separated from any ruling party interest and so on and so forth. And this, of course, would then also have an impact on um, consequences, legal consequences on, on what's happening in the countries. As Gabriela has said, many of the things are detected and disclosed in Hungary, but this has no consequences at all. And that's even more frustrating. Thanks a lot for everyone who was listening, participating. Um, sending us the questions and hopefully we will come back to you with some more positive uh, outcome uh, but for today i would like to close and um, thank you all once again uh, stay healthy 
And if there's anything else you would like um, uh, to address to the commission and also maybe as a whistleblower, let us know. Don't hesitate to contact our office. We will, of course, treat you your um, questions very confidential and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.